Muhammad's followers tell the world that he destroyed all the pagan Arabian beliefs and traditions and brought them the new religion of Islam. How accurate and true are these claims? It is incumbent upon us to repeat as many times as necessary that almost all their claims are untrue, unsubstantiated, false and deceptive because the moment they are put under scrutiny based entirely upon the Muhammadan records themselves, all these mendacities can be and are uncovered. Let us start with the fact that all Muhammadan scholars agree that the practice of pilgrimage existed centuries before the rise of Muhammadan Islam. Muhammad and his pagan Arab, the tribe of Quraysh, as well as other pagan Arabs, were accustomed to celebrating this pilgrimage. Even after Muhammad declared himself the Apostle of Allah, he and his followers continued to perform the pilgrimage's rites with the pagans at the Kaaba, which was still a house of idolatry since it still contained all 360 idols of stone. In the final analysis, Muhammad only changed a few items from the pagan traditions and fetishes, but successfully rubbed each one of them with his version of Islam. Almost every major Islamic history book documents these facts. After the conquest of Mecca, the pilgrimage was turned by Muhammad into one of the five pillars of Muhammadan Islam. Muhammad banned the Arab polytheists from the Hajj after the year of the conquest. They were given four months either to embrace his cult of Islam or be slaughtered. Thus it will always be with peaceful Muhammadan Islam. After that, Muhammad made very slight changes in the ceremonial rituals of the pilgrimage, although he destroyed all the idols of the Kaaba. Yet Muhammad himself continued to practice many pagan rituals. He did not abolish them nor reject them. This created some consternation among some of his followers who expected him to completely uproot these idolatrous rudiments. Muhammadan Muslims continued and continue to date to practice many of the pre-Islamic pagan rituals such as running between the two hills of Safa and Marwa or kissing the black stone. In the first case, Arab polytheists were accustomed to running between the two hills to glorify the idols that were erected whom they called Isaf and Naila. When Muhammad destroyed the idols, his followers were ashamed to continue this practice and asked Muhammad about it. Soon, he claimed that a Quranic verse was revealed to him in which this practice was reordained. Hadith Bukhari 2.195, for instance, remarks, One of the companions said to Anas bin Malik, Did you use to hate running between the Safa and Marwa? He said, Yes because it was part of the pre-Islamic rituals until Allah gave Muhammad this verse and proclaimed that it was also one of Allah's ceremonial rites. We also read in Sahih Muslim 3.411, adherents of the Prophet, when they were still in the pre-Islamic period, used to come up to visit two idols, Isaf and Naila. Then they would go and run between Safa and Marwa. Then they would have their hair cut. When Islam was established, they hated to run between them, but Allah sent down this verse. Al-Baqarah 2.158 Safa and Marwa are among the symbols of Allah. So if those who visit the house in the season or at other times should compass them round it, there is no sin in them. In Asbab al-Nuzul by Imam al-Suyuti, page 27, Ibn Abbas himself said, the demons in the Jahiliyyah used to circumnavigate all night around these two mountains. The idols were erected between them. When Islam came, they, the Muslims, said, O oh, Apostle of Allah, we would never run between the Safa and Marwa because this is an unfavorable matter which we were accustomed to do in the Jahiliyyah. Thus Allah gave the verse above. This unfavorable matter was strongly related to idolatry, but even so, Muhammad refused to abolish it and several Quranic verses were given to confirm it. Muhammad himself performed it and Muhammadan Muslims are still practicing it today. Fiqh Sunnah 5.85 attempts to explain the historical background for the Sa'i, the running between Safa and Marwa. Ibn Abbas said, Prophet Ibrahim brought Hajar, his wife, and her son Ismail, whom she was still nursing as a baby, and left them at the site of the house of Allah under a tree above the Zamzam. Mecca at that time was a place where there was neither water nor any dweller. He left a bag of dates and a container of water for them. Hajar, 
drank from the whole water container and nursed her baby until all the water she had was gone. Her son grew hungrier and hungrier. She could hardly bear to look at him. She went and stood at Safa, the hill nearest to her. She looked down the valley to see if there was someone who could help. She could see no one. So she climbed down Safa and reached the valley. She struggled hard, crossed the valley and reached Marwa. She stood on Marwa and looked around. Still, she could not see anyone around. She repeated this seven times. Ibn Abbas added, the Prophet said, it is to commemorate this walk that pilgrims walk between Safa and Marwa. Our listeners should be made aware that the above story was concocted by Muhammad and his followers since the Bible has no knowledge of Abraham, Ishmael and Hagar of ever having visited Arabia or Mecca. In fact, the names Allah, Mecca, Kaaba, Zamzam, etc. do not exist anywhere in the Bible. Moreover, why would Allah have a house in Mecca where there was no water and no people? Why does the Quran assert that it was Abraham and Ishmael who actually put up the foundations of the house if there already was a house in situ? Can anyone among the believers who are listening dispute what we are saying? Sunan of Abu Dawud, Hadith 1867, narrated by Abu Huraira. The Apostle of Allah entered Mecca, and after the Apostle of Allah had gone forward to the stone and touched it, he went round the house, the Kaaba. He then went to a Safa and mounted it so that he could look at the house. Then he raised his hands and began to mention to Allah as much as he wished and make supplication. al tirmidhi Hadith 2624, narrated by Aisha. The Prophet said, throwing pebbles at the Jamra and running between the Safa and Al Marwa were appointed only for the remembrance of Allah. Ladies and gentlemen, not a single word in the hadiths above represent any theological truth or fact based on any documentary evidence or even upon any oral pagan Arabian tradition. The agenda of Muhammadan scholars had been and continues to be the creation for the Arabs and Muhammad a worthy genealogy, an ancestry and a history connecting the Hebrews, Abraham and Ishmael to themselves. They were and are still willing to go to any length of perversity, mendacity, deception and any depth of stupidity and illogic to achieve this goal. Every alleged tradition of theirs is mere chimera and mirage of their fertile imagination as far away from any truth as the furthest galaxy is from the earth. It is a pitiful and a pitiable sight when so-called learned Muhammadan scholars stoop to such levels of intellectual and theological depravity against all facts and all of documented history. To prove my point, let us decipher the above stories item by item. Abraham, Hagar and Ishmael, according to the original story in the Bible, never went to Mecca or Arabia. Ishmael resided in the land of Paran. Two, the well that was revealed to Hagar was in Beersheba in the land of Canaan and not in Mecca in Arabia and was not called Zamzam. Three, Abraham, Hagar and Ishmael had no knowledge of any God called Allah. Four, when Hagar and Ishmael were dismissed from Abraham's household, Ishmael was a teenager of at least 14 years of age and was definitely not a suckling baby. Genesis 21.12 to 21. 5. By what standard of logic should one believe that a holy place existed, the house of Allah, in a place called Mecca, where no one lived since there was no water to sustain life? 6. According to other hadiths, Zamzam was a well in the valley where Mecca was, and not above the town. Hence, what is the Zamzam referred to here if it is not a well? 7. All that Muhammad and his followers performed during the Hajj up to the present time, such as the running between Safa and Marwa, the kissing or touching of the black stone, the Ihram, the Umrah, etc., etc., were pagan Arabian traditions and fetishes long before Muhammad and his Quran. 8. Since according to the Quran, the Bible is Allah's revelations to the people of Israel, then how is it possible that the stories as depicted in the Quran contradict every one of these divine revelations? Muhammad had no choice but to incorporate all the pagan Arabian traditions and fetishes into his new cult beliefs. Otherwise, his Quraysh tribe and the other pagan Arabs would not have followed him. That is, 
he very conveniently Islamized them and gave them a biblical background to make them sanctified and holy.